All right, well, welcome back, Team ET. Welcome to another week, and uh, it's great to have you with us again. We've got a really interesting guest with us, as I always say, but it's very true. Um, Eric Gerard, Eric's uh, L and D professional. Let's put it that way. Um, you've done so much in the learning development space, Eric, over the space of several decades, and um, I'm really looking forward to digging into some of that background and, and understanding who you are a little bit more. But um, welcome to the ET project. Great to have you on board with us. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here, Wayne. Yeah. So. Let's start with a little bit of background about who you are and what you know what you've been doing and what's brought you to this moment in time. So background, I'll try to keep it short. I've been in learning and development my entire career, which is over 30 years now. And I spent 20 years of that in Silicon Valley, um, working at places like Apple, Applied Materials, Nutanix, Symantec. So I've, I've worked at some pretty heavy hitters in Silicon Valley. And in 2020, during the pandemic, my wife and I said, you know what, Silicon Valley is crazy, crazy, let's up and move. And so we moved, I started my business, my wife started a, a side hustle, and got a new job, and we bought a house, and I became a scuba instructor all during the pandemic, all during 2020. Wow. And so since then, I've been focused all on management development and helping new managers transition from being great individual contributors to great people managers. Excellent. So you went north, I believe. So you're sitting up in yeah. Washington at the moment. And, uh, yeah, so Silicon Valley is is roughly in the middle of the state on the coast. And uh, I'm now off the coast or um, across the sound from Seattle. Yeah, but you, you've got Big Brother up there, Microsoft sitting up in Seattle still, I believe. So you haven't yeah. totally moved away from the IT scene and, and the, no. you know, the, the high tech. So if I look at your background, Eric, you know, you've, You've been in L&D, as you've said, but you've had the opportunity to work around the world delivering um, facilitating programs in, in multiple countries. What was the experience for you? You know, I, I love traveling. The, the older I get, the less I like jet lag. Um, but I love traveling and I love experiencing new places and I love experiencing new food. Um, one of my favorite experiences was I was teaching in Malaysia and the, the hotel I was in had an amazing food court. So I was there for a week and ate a different cuisine for every meal. And uh, yeah, I gained 10 pounds in a week. I just, I loved it. But, you know, it's, it's really fun to see how some, some of the wisdom that I grew up with as far as learning styles and um, adult learning theory hold the same regardless of where you are. And then at the same time, there are also cultural differences. And so right. that's also been fascinating to, to learn and to be able to weave in with my experience with uh, cross-cultural consulting. Right. Gosh, I'd, I'd forgotten about Malcolm Knowles. So thank you for yeah. the reminder on the adult learning theory. Um, yeah, look, I, I um, had the, the good fortune to live around the world and experience multiple cultures. And hence the reason for the question, because I know when you go to some of these locations, um, the way that the training or the facilitation is received takes a while to get used to, right? Some audiences are more engaging, some are very uh, conservative, and less outgoing, let's put it that way, and, and it's often a challenge. You, you, you do so many things. I was just looking at your bio a little bit earlier, and, you know, you, you, you're licensed or you create um, e-learning was uh, certified in so many different areas. You did situational intelligence, and that's not right. Situational leadership. Sorry, I'll get it right. That's situational it. leadership. Uh, you know, you, you crucial conversations, crucial accounting. You're a DISC um, facilitator. You know, you've got all these things. What what do you find the biggest challenge today when you uh, set out? to create a program for an organization? Well, you know, you mentioned I've got all these certifications, so I've probably over-certified myself, if I'm honest. Um, I, you know, I just, I, I love learning and I love keeping up on the latest and greatest. So the next thing on my list will probably be Gallup Strengths. Mm. Um, you know, one of these, one of these days that'll, that'll make the list. But 
you know, the, the, the challenge I have is I've got access to all this good stuff and clients only have a certain amount of time and money. Right. And so trying to get the, to understand clearly what the client needs, what their audience needs and presenting that rather than going to the toy box and saying, Oh, we could do this and we could do that like that. Yeah. That's not helpful. Overloading a client is not a, not a good way to start. And so making sure to really do a good needs analysis and understand what's needed um, by the folks on the ground is the most important part, I think. Yeah, I, lo I love that tip. I mean, working with so many facilitators, particularly those that are subject matter experts that mm -hmm. are brought in to um, share their knowledge, share their wisdom, they, they may have a thousand ideas in their toolbox and they try and deliver all of them in one day. And it, it's just a disaster in the making. And so I think understanding exactly the need, as you've said, and being able to factor in the amount of time you've got to impart that knowledge and get that um, knowledge embedded. How, how, how do you go about um, helping people retain the knowledge? So I'm talking... I'm talking facilitator to facilitator now. I'm sorry, audience, <laughs> but it's a really interesting question. And, and for any of you that are listening, you know, facilitation is really a major skill for all leaders. So um, it's not just for us in this realm of L&D. You know, as a leader, you need to be able to facilitate whether it's a meeting, whether it's an event, um, you're working with a team, right? So. How do you, Eric, how do you approach this um, concept of memory retention or information retention? Yeah. So I go back to something I learned in my first training job. So this is in 1992, and I was teaching people how to use their Macs and how to use Windows back when the mouse was still new. So mice right. were fairly new yep. devices in the workplace. Um, and, and the, the mnemonic that I learned or the, the, the mantra that I learned was tell, show, do. So I'm going to tell you about it and then I'm going to show you how to do it. And then you're going to do it. Um, and so I always keep my lectures minimum. I explain a concept. I'll demonstrate the concept if it needs a demo. And then as soon as possible, I get participants to do it. So then you're engaging as many learning styles as possible. So you're getting the verbal, um, the kinesthetic, uh, the the folks who like to read, the, the folks who like to see things, trying to co collect, collapse as much of that as possible into a learning activity during during the program. And then after the program, I always talk about the, the forgetting curve and the fact that the forgetting curve is a real thing. And so to combat that, I ask folks to partner up with one or two other people that they've gotten to know through the program and make a coffee date right there in the room. So pull out your phones, make an appointment to get together within one calendar week, within seven right. calendar days to talk about what you learned and apply it and maybe make that a recurring meeting. It doesn't have to be super long, 15 minutes over a cup of coffee, but just make sure that you do something with the information that you got because otherwise it will vaporize. And you know, one thing that I also don't do anymore, remember training binders? You go to a class, you get a big thick binder. I don't do binders anymore. If, if, if I print handouts, it's a very thin handout with lots of room for notes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not printing books for people to reread. It's just the basics and lots of room for them to, to write their, their insights. A small workbook rather than handbook. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. Great advice. If we were just talking before we hit record and we're talking about, um, instructor-led versus virtual instructor, the transition for many leaders today to conducting Zoom meetings like we're on now, to being able to connect, in our case, talking about facilitation, what, what have you found is the greatest challenge from a virtual perspective in trying to facilitate learning? You know, the first thing that pops into my head is the technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's of course the fact that I'm trying to connect with you from a distance over, you know, over a camera, over the internet, right. you know, yeah. and you're in a different country. So there's all of that, but first principles, the technology I think is still glitchy. 
So I was just recording a podcast this morning with a woman who um, is in Mexico City. And we had to start and stop eight times because she kept freezing, she kept freezing. And you know who knows where the problem was, whether it was in the software we were using, whether it was my end or her end or something in between. So I think that the technology still creates a bottleneck and those glitches, those hangups, um, differences in audio quality, differences in visual quality cause issues that then take away from learning and take away from bonding. Yeah. Um, you know, and then, you know, add to that the fact that I'm trying to have a, a connection with a human being, but the way I look you in the eyes is to look at my camera up there. You're yes. down there. Yeah, exactly. But to look at you, to look you in the eye, I have to look at a camera, which is not very engaging for me. Right. So that's it, it's things like that that I think we'll get better at. I have I have faith in the technology. Um, it's just going to take some time. And it's still, in my humble opinion, I still don't think it's going to be as good as being in person with folks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think the jury's out on, you know, whether whether we're ever going to transfer 100% to virtual. It's definitely shifted a long way on the axis towards virtual. But um, being old school myself, I'm very much an in-person facilitator. I, I miss that connection, I miss being able to see the whole person and read their whole body language, not just the upper half of the body. So there's a there's a few things that we lose in the in the um, transition. I think um, we could talk about facilitation and and all these types of things for, for hours. So I apologise to the <laughs> listeners if if you're already a little bit bored with this. I'm I'm fascinated by it and. Uh, Eric's such a, a guru in this space. I just wanted to leverage some of your knowledge. So thank you. Let's transition now ourselves to the topic that you're really passionate about, um, which is helping new managers transition. And as you rightly say, uh, yesterday we were guardians of ourselves, and then all of a sudden we're given this new role, this title of a manager and we're sort of now responsible for other people and quite often that transition is so foreign that we just totally stop it. So where did you first put your, or how did you come to put your focus on this specific area? What was the trigger that you into? Yeah, trigger is a good word for it. So like many other folks, I was managed badly by new managers. So especially in Silicon Valley, um, folks who were peers of mine would be promoted. And they all had good intentions, but they were unprepared. Uh, you know, and maybe they got a little bit of an ego trip because it's like, okay, I, I was one of them. Now I'm the boss. So now I'm going to do it my way. Um, and without being properly prepared, you know, to do things like, change the mindset from, from doer to leader, um, learning how to set good goals, learning how to be a good coach without understanding how to do those things. Yeah. Folks made a mess. And I, you know, my teammates and I suffered because of it. Mm. So I thought, Hmm, there's, some, there's something there. Let me, let me think about that. Then when I got to applied materials, I got promoted. So I worked on a team of three and then my boss promoted me without any uh, any training. He said, okay, now you're leading these two. And oh, by the way, one of them is a problem and I want them gone. So right away, I got sandbagged and had to, to manage out one of my team members. Mm. And because I wasn't prepared, I made an absolute mess of that. I really did. And if I ever meet these person people in, in person again, I'm going to apologize and grovel for being such a terrible manager. But when I walked away from that experience, I thought, never again. I, I don't want that to happen to anybody ever again. So that's my origin story is, is having had it done to me and then having done it to others, having committed the sin myself, I thought, you know what, I'm going to make this my life's work. So now I've done, I've done lots of reading, you know, beside me is a stack of books, including one of my current favorites, um, The Coaching Habit by Mike, Michael Stanier. I think that every, every employee deserves great coaching. And it's on the manager to do that coaching. And so, you know, you don't have to go and become ICF certified. You don't have to go become a, a formal coach, but right. learn how to ask good, thoughtful questions rather than telling. Yes. Um, and that will improve your employee's life a lot. 
So those are just some of the things that I've picked up over time. And I've decided, you know what, I know enough about this now that I'm going to make a business out of it. And so hmm. now here I am. Excellent. And we were just talking before you, sorry, you have an ebook um, that you've put out, which is correct, the title, but Advice for New Managers, basically. And you mm -hmm. offer six tips or six steps to uh, making that transition easier and better. Uh, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe we can go through those six briefly and just uh, look at them. But, you know, the first one you talk about is empathy. And mm -hmm. you, you're big on empathy. So I'd love to hear some of your insights around why you believe it's so important. Yeah, so not only is it the first chapter in the ebook, and I'm actually in the process of writing a proper book um, right. that's going to be aimed at, at new managers. I have yet to, to decide on a title. I think I have one, um, but if folks want to help me crowdsource the, the cover and the title of the book, I will, I will take that help. Um, but the first and longest chapter in, in the book, in the ebook and in the proper book, is about empathy because I think in tw in the 2020s, you know, we're talking about this in 2023. Mm. In the 2020s, it's so important for for managers to understand. You know what? People are stressed. People are overwhelmed with all the things that are going on around the world. Like right now, we've got Ukraine. We've got the the debt ceiling and the fact that we're this close to a default with the United States debt. Um, we've got you know problems around the world. We've got the fact that COVID is gone, but not really gone. And there may be other things coming. Um, you know, COVID went away and got friends. So, you know, that's just what's going on at a macro level. And then you got the fact that so many people have checked out of the workplace and have left. And so the people who are left in the workplace are completely overloaded. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a lot for any human being to handle. And so I think as a manager and as a leader, it's important to have a little bit of empathy, not necessarily to become someone's therapist. I wouldn't say that. That's what employee assistance programs are for. Um, but to be at least be able to listen deeply and understand and say, listen, I hear you. I'm with you. I'm walking with you. And you know, together, we're going to get through that. So I think that that's the first skill. And if you're not a naturally empathetic person, it's a skill that you can learn. Um, there's tons of books. You know, Daniel Goleman wrote the seminal book on emotional intelligence. And there are other books that are not um, quite as dense as that book that you can pick up at any bookstore that will help you learn emotional intelligence and learn how to be empathetic um, so that then you can lead a group of people um, through the ups and downs of corporate life or you know organizational life and do that in a way that has people thinking, yeah, wow, this person has got my back and understands me. Yeah, fantastic. I, I was just reading an email from Daniel Goldman. I, I subscribed to his newsletter and, and he's just coming out this morning, actually, my time, saying that uh, Microsoft had released a report saying there'll be something like 300 million jobs lost, transitioned through AI, et cetera. And the three key requirements, according to the survey, uh, one of those is to have emotional intelligence. And of course, empathy is one of the big cornerstones of emotional intelligence. So I, I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, you know, Goldman talks about three stages of empathy. I, I know you talk about Brene Brown's comments. She talks about one of those stages, emotional mm -hmm. feeling uh, rather than just seeing and um, being aware. Um, mm -hmm. So very, very much on board with it. Um, transitioning is a second point that you highlight and you you have five misconceptions that you highlight we don't have to go through all of them but maybe you can just touch on it briefly what is it about the transition itself that you you highlight you know i i think what a lot of folks assume is that when you get the title of manager when you're some kind of a leader you automatically have a great deal of authority and you know, because you you can wield the scepter of power, uh, you're able to magically make people do things, and that is just not the case. Um, you know, I've 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 been in situations um, when folks had that had that authority and wield it pretty heavily, and it had the opposite effect. You know, they didn't get the results they wanted. Mm. Um, 
because what you need instead of power and authority is influence. And influence takes a lot of work um, to, to build influence and to, to wield influence well so that you don't lose your credibility with folks. And so I would, I would advise any new manager, anybody who is manager curious or management curious, you're thinking about it, build your influence skills so that um, you're not trying to beat people into submission, but, you know, again, slowly turning the ship your way kind of a thing. Yeah, it's great, great advice. I mean, all six of your tips are great advice, but we won't have the time to go in depth into all of them, unfortunately. But um, the other the other four, and we'll pick a couple of these, delegation, um, trust, Lencioni's uh, dysfunctional mm -hmm. teams. Uh, you talk about coaching and feedback and um, setting goals or performance management through goal setting. Uh, you know, they're, they're so practical, foundational, elements for leaders or new leaders in particular but for all leaders to be honest um is is there any overarching message that you'd like to give new managers um, about their approach as they're coming into the role is there anything specifically that you talk about you know there's a fantastic book called what got you here won't get you there mm. And, and I think that the, the, the precepts of that book are really applicable to new managers. You know, whether you're a new manager or whether you're a director becoming an executive sort of a thing, it still, it still works the same. And that is the skill set that made you excellent in your old job is probably the opposite of the skill set you need to be great in your new job. Mm. Um, so as an individual contributor, as a great facilitator, um, you know, I was great at facilitating. I was great at creating instructional design. I was great at writing. Um, I was great at creating widgets, you know, whatever it is. If I'm an engineer, I'm great at coding. But when you get promoted into a, a leadership position, into a management position, um, you actually have to let a lot of that go. And there, there actually might be some grieving associated with that because it's like, well, wait, I really like doing that thing over there. But your job is now about getting work done through others. And to get work done through others, you need an entirely new skill set mm -hmm. of influence and goal setting and coaching and providing feedback in a way that is kind and yet constructive. You can do both. Um, so those are the sorts of things that we have to let go of is, you know, our domain, our domain expertise right. has to get downplayed. And in a lot of places, you still have to be a domain expert to some degree. You still have to be able to do some of the work. But most of what you do as a manager is, is motivate others to get the work done. And I think that that's a big mindset shift for a lot of folks. Yeah, for sure. There, there's so many points there we could dive into. We don't have the time, unfortunately. But um, feedback is often one that, that I like to work with my clients about because it's such an easy statement, particularly when we talk about seeking feedback, not delivering that necessarily, but seeking feedback as a leader. Because, you know, at, at some stage, we get that big S painted on our chest when we are called a leader. We think we're superhuman, and, and why should we need to get feedback about our performance? That, that egotistical mindset comes into the fore. So, how do you talk with your groups that you facilitate to around this topic of feedback, particularly in seeking feedback? What's your um, suggestions for? Them? Yeah. So the, the first thing I talk about is the fact that you can be completely candid and completely respectful and completely kind when you're giving feedback, you can do all those things. So you don't have to water down your message. You don't have to be wishy-washy, but you can choose a kind tone of voice. You can choose kind words. Yeah. Those, those are all things that we can, we can do. And it might take some practice, but that's something that we can do. The second thing I would say is always, always deliver feedback in person. So whether it's via Zoom or over the phone or actually in person, I think that those are is to deliver feedback, giving feedback over Slack or via email or via instant message, bad move. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's way too easy to misinterpret tone of voice and things like that when you're reading feedback. 
And it's just, to me, it's a sign of respect. You know, it's like, hey, you can tee somebody up and let them know, I've got a little feedback for you. Can you talk in half an hour? Okay, at least the person knows there's this, this feedback coming. That's fine. Um, but don't deliver that feedback over electronic medium. You know, use as much human-centered communication as you can, you know, via via Zoom or something like that, because it's just it it takes the sting out of what might be constructive feedback. If you've got negative feedback or constructive feedback to deliver, if you can at least make virtual eye contact and smile and and watch your tone of voice when you're delivering it and choose your words it's going to go down better than if you do it the other way. Mm. So that's a big thing. And so then I would say to receive feedback, I would ask for it and just let people know, hey, I want some feedback from you. And I would prefer it if you would give it to me in person, if you would give it to me via phone or via Zoom or via um, in person rather than in writing, okay? Yeah. Just just yeah. so that there's no misunderstanding. Yeah. And then, you know, again, for, for receiving feedback, you know, be open for it. Look, take the good, leave the bad. So have an openness to, okay, you know, there's, there's room for improvement here. Um, I can definitely improve. And, you know, you don't have to agree with everything that somebody says. And so just, just because you're giving me feedback, doesn't mean you've got a patent on the truth. Mm. Um, you know, so, so there's, there's room for folks to accept and not accept what they want as long as they're looking for, you know, what's good in this. Um, I think that that's important as well. Yeah, great, great um, piece of insight there. That everybody has their own perspective on a situation. It doesn't necessarily mean it's correct, right? Um, however, if you, if you aren't open to it, if you're closed off immediately, it doesn't matter what they say. You're yeah. only going to hear what you want to say and you're going to interpret it the way you want which, which highlights one other aspect that I'd like to touch on that I know you talk about as well, which is your own biases, your cognitive biases, um, and how they come to the fore, if you like, when you're a leader. And sometimes your biases may lead you down the wrong path. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what's your feeling about how people can deal with this? When it comes to bias, I think... For me, a good bias killer is getting a lot of input. Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm about to make a big decision or when I'm uh, when I'm struggling with something, I will ask people in my inner circle and maybe people who are not necessarily in my inner circle, but I'll ask several people for advice on, hey, what do you think about X? What should I do about Y? Right. Um, and and kind of assemble a team uh, to, to give me some advice. Again, it doesn't mean that I have to accept or do everything that they say. But at least I'm not running around with my own biases running wild because Lord knows I've got a whole host of bi biases running loose in my head. Yeah. But if I can get Darren and David um, and a couple of other folks to speak into my head a little bit and say, well, yeah. consider this. Have you thought about that? Then I'm less likely to run wild with um, the mayhem that's going on uh, between my ears. Right. In, in finance, they talk about the four eyes principle where they want to make sure more than one person is looking at the financials. I, yeah. I leverage that and talk about that from a perspectives point of view. So I, I suggest to people that they have at least two other inputs into decision making and, and ideas. And but as you said, the more the better. Right? Yep. Within reason. Absolutely. Within reason. Um, Something else just popped into my mind as you were talking there, and now I've forgotten because I was talking myself. So I apologize. I should have been listening better. Uh, as, as we're winding down towards the end of the, the recording, I'm, we haven't touched on one of your pet hobbies. Uh, I want to call it a hobby. I don't know if you do it professionally, but you scuba dive. So how does scuba diving play into the broader scheme of things for you in helping new managers learn about their transition. I can imagine scuba diving presents some challenges as well um, for you as you're learning how to scuba dive. Is there any correlation you can make? You know, I think so. Um, scuba, for the longest time, scuba was, was my selfish thing. I did scuba only for me to relax, to go float in the water, to go see interesting creatures and things like that. Mm. 
And then when I was uh, diving in Maui a couple of years ago, um, I got it in my head that I wanted to become a scuba instructor and semi-retire in a few years and teach scuba someplace tropical. So, so, you know, again, it's kind of selfish. It's like, okay, I want to, um, you know, teach scuba and make a little money and I want to live someplace tropical while I'm doing that. But while I was learning how to teach scuba, um, I was reminded of some of the principles of how to teach and provide feedback and, and bring people along, along an idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm standing in the shallow end of a pool and I've got a group of eager divers in front of me and they're eager and they're also scared because they've never breathed in the water before. Mm -hmm. And so how can I take these people from standing, breathing air above the water to bending over and breathing through a regulator for the first time and get them to do that and come up smiling and not freaked out. Right. And so I think that the, the parallel to that in management is like in change management. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the change in scuba is going from breathing air to breathing through a regulator underwater. Right. How can I make that attractive? How can I make that change attractive and interesting and intriguing and ultimately fun and satisfying. Like, wow, that felt good. Like we went through something scary and now look at where we are. Mm. So I think I think that there are parallels, you know, in teaching scuba and things like change management, um, things like overcoming fear, overcoming resistance, um, adjusting the way that you approach different people. Because I might have a class of eight different people with eight different learning styles or eight different styles. And so I've got to pivot, pivot, pivot for each person so that they all have a great experience. Well, I think a manager has to do that too. You know, you've got a team of eight people. Um, they're all going to have different needs and you've got to switch quickly from one to the next, one to the next. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that there are several different parallels that way. Yeah, I love that. that that's great advice in itself in, in recognizing that everyone is unique. And as a leader, we need to be um, mindful of that constantly. And so just because we see things one way our team is going to see it in multiple other ways as well. We, we have mm -hmm. to really be open and, as you say, pivot as needed. So, Eric, great conversation. Where can people connect with you? So you can get a hold of me a few ways. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm all over LinkedIn. I publish um, uh, LinkedIn posts uh, three times a week. I've got a couple of different newsletters that you can sign up for. If you head to my website, GerardTrainingSolutions.com, you can pick up the ebook that Wayne mentioned. Um, and you can also get on my mailing list where you get my newsletter. Um, and then, of course, the, the proper book will be coming out probably this fall. And uh, that'll be available on Amazon. So watch out for that probably October. Excellent. We'll, uh, we'll make a note in the show notes. And, and you mentioned about people giving you suggestions about the title. So how would we do that? Shoot me a note to Eric at GerardTrainingSolutions.com. Okay. Yeah. So maybe maybe the place to start is to look at the um, look at the ebook yep. and look at the title for the ebook because the the the, the proper book is going to be an expansion of that. Mm -hmm. And let me know what you think a better title would be based on that. Right. Excellent. I look forward to it. Any final words of wisdom um, that you would leave with new managers? I know we've covered a lot of territory today, but any, any final parting comment that you would like to leave? You know, I would say uh, read deeply, uh, never stop learning, and learn how to be a great coach. Hmm. Three great tips. Fantastic. Well, Eric Gerard, great uh, conversation. We, we could literally have talked for hours about each one of these topics. I mean, they're so, they're so foundational and so important. Um, We've, we've really literally skimmed the surface on so much here, but covered a, a huge amount of territory. And, and I appreciate the conversation, uh, appreciate you being a guest on the show. So thank you and um, all the best for the book and all the best for the future. Thanks, Wayne. I appreciate it. It was good being here. So what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button below and click on the bell icon so I can pop up in your feed occasionally with a great tip for your ultimate growth.